People often wonder how a man continues to put out audio files. He listens to God. He talks about the topics that the Lord leads him to. And today's hot topics are a couple things going on in the news across the land and around the globe. And then we've got the political climate of an upcoming presidential election. My own mother absolutely adores Trump, and I think that's wonderful. I liked him and the way that he marked himself in the presidency. I saw it long ago that his whole goal was to take himself into the hearts, minds, and souls of the normal, traditional American person who's never read a book of his, never knew that he was a business billionaire of sorts, and never understood that he was offering mentoring and training to people in real estate and other things to make himself additional money on top of what he was already doing in his own monstrous company. Now that's just me talking about an observation. It doesn't mean I've got it all correct. It doesn't mean I followed his life to a T. But I knew he wrote a book with Kiyosaki, which I was impressed by. Because I like Robert Kiyosaki, and most people in my line of work do too. There are a lot of people in network marketing who don't know him, but they should know him. Now let's talk about network marketing for just a moment. Network marketing is anything we're selling. If we're selling a church program, that's network marketing. If we're talking about where we attend our faith practice, that's network marketing. If we love a restaurant in the community and we share it with someone else like I did waiting for the library to open, that's network marketing. And I love that little Chinese couple that runs that little hole-in-the-wall restaurant because I always get a good food that is never harmed. And I like that. There are some great places in fast food that I like to talk about because their people are so good. Popeye's Chicken around Indianapolis has wonderful people for the most part. Really great, thoughtful, compassionate, caring management who will just do just about anything to help a person who's really sincerely trying to get on in life. There are other places like McDonald's that have a mixed bag of people working for them, but for the most part, they have policies in place to protect people. Now, when I talk about these things, I'm talking about real activities that everyday human beings can engage in. I'm not talking about anything unique and special that makes them mind-blowing ideas. I'm just simply saying that in life, we have moments of time to produce either a hero in someone's life or a villain. The heroes of the land help people to go on in life. The villains of the land don't. We've got all this electronic technology happening, and I've got all this stuff beeping and going on around me in a library that doesn't need all this electrical complications for people's lives. The computer screen's dim, the lights turn off while you're in the middle of stuff, the bathroom's flushed multiple times while you're still sitting on a throne, and it's annoying as hell for most people of my generation. Whereas other people think it's really cold because it's supposedly supposed to conserve water. I don't think so if it's flushing every few minutes while I'm sitting there waiting to finish my stool. Like what just happened now? The light literally just went off. So I have to move my chair and it'll come back on. This is the ridiculousness of someone who thought they'd play around with me while I'm in a lab that's supposed to be used for private use and other things. Now, my silly beard might be funny to people. It's also become a marketing concept for me to utilize while I'm going through this struggle to figure out what I'm supposed to be doing in life. It's not the point to figure out how people react to men with beards like mine, where it's a little unkempt, where it might be not exactly perfectly squeaky clean is not true. I keep myself pretty well groomed in that regard. But I haven't figured out how to manage a beard like this because I've never had one before. I always had a long goatee, and that was it. That was the extent of it. I can tell you it's a pain sometimes, but I'm going to keep it and see how long it grows. I'll also continue to shave my head once I find myself a shaver that works, but it's my job to do those things, not someone else's. I've not given someone the right to touch my body in the night, but they do that. I've not given a police officer the right to put markers and other things in my shirt, but people do that. I have not given anyone the right to lord over my life, any health care person or any other person, yet I go to churches to sit down to worship the holy God and someone's putting a play on my life thinking they have the right to call and monkey in my rights. I want those pastors to start preaching about human rights. I want the president of the land to start talking about the right to a person's body is not his to take away. You see, this is the ridiculous commentary that's going on right now that supposedly, allegedly, sexuality and a person's private parts is a political topic. Who the heck gave anyone the right to say that? The Lord is not pleased by that. I can pretty much guarantee that. There's too many Bible verses that say this is a private matter. And frankly, if we believe Lord God made every single thing and every single human being, who are these people and pastors and other Christian right people who think they have the right to say that any child of the Lord is an abomination because of what they feel and how they love and what they do in those private moments with their individual spouses, soulmates, or whoever the heck else is they choose to have an intimate moment with? 
Intimacy is not something regulated by other people. Yes, we have laws about what age demographic is okay to participate in those things based on the mental health, not at all, based on the mind and the intelligence of understanding what can happen if you do these things. There's all sorts of illness. There's all sorts of pregnancy. There's all sorts of complications. There's all sorts of expense with anything that's unplanned, and that's the reality. In Georgia, these men are out of control. I was so pleased to hear our actress sort of put it in their face in a way, but I would have more been more pleased if she said, you know, this is an international human rights treaty that you are violating with regard to women specifically, but also with regard to men's penises. How dare you think you have the right to decide whether or not someone's penis and phallus and neophallus or whatever it's called for them, by them, by the medical community who was allowed to see their britches down is your right to say anything about. How dare you tell a woman she has not enough upstairs in her chest? How dare you tell her she needs to have it removed so she doesn't have a heart attack? How dare you not do it if she wants it done? And openly we're getting into the fact of pregnancy is totally at the discretion of a woman and man and whether or not they use birth control. And if they didn't, that's not the issue. People can lie about what they did and didn't do in the heat of the moment all the time. The reality is that practically most men and women think first, act second. Yes, there are moments of passionate opportunities in life. We've all experienced them. We've also had moments of opportunities with other people's spouses that we've declined because it would have been improper despite how incredible it might have been in those moments soulfully. You see, I had a mom parade me through a dark house one time. She was in a skimpy sundress, and it was difficult as a man to not go, this feels a little bit like I'm being propositioned for something, but I'm not exactly sure that she's really understanding that because we're talking about God in these moments. But to any other man, he might have seen it as an invitation to something more than what she was really offering. And if he got it wrong, he might have left offended or he might have pursued it anyway. In my mind, I just thought, you know, this is a pure spirit I love very much. I'm not going there, even though it feels a little bit different than normal to me. When I talk about these things, I'm talking about them from an honest perspective of a male's mind. And when I talk about my own opportunities in life, it's my story to share no one else's. Yet I have siblings who think they have the right to talk all day long about my private parts and my opportunities in life and any other thing my mother wants to lie to herself about thinking she has the right to say, which is untrue. Now, when I say stuff like this, you think I'm being improper. You think I'm being uh, without acting without propriety, but that's not true. The real world is full of dysfunctional families, and I come from one completely since my father's passing. We sort of had loving relationship up until the time that he got ill, and afterwards it was difficult as hell because spouses kept getting involved in things that were birthright only opportunities, and other people kept violating those rights. You see, it's the violation of rights that are the issues of the land. The issues of the land that are caused threats, stress, and other types of temptations are all about propriety and rights. The men and women of the world have been given their own bodies to utilize the way that they choose, not the way that someone else feels they have the right to utilize them. Now, in life, we have moments of time to make short opportunities to show people we have the skills, to do our work. And then we also have longer systems and longer orations and longer sermons to talk about, to let people know, I am here. I am not going to say I'm queer, even though I've said that in jest in other audio files, I'm trying to say, look, we're all a little strange because God made us all to be unique individuals. We have groups of affinities that we like to participate in. And when someone goes to the house of the Lord, he expects to receive simple things, simple courtesies, simple politenesses, Yet we have monsters in those places doing the welcome wagon. So it's such a poor job that people do not return. I literally was welcomed into a house of the Lord this morning when I was waiting for a person at the Good Samaritan Network. I had not planned exactly to go to the church. I mean, I knew that God wanted me to go, but I also knew I was going on his timing, not my own. I was sitting on my stool, as I always do, although someone has cut the strap when I left it accidentally in my storage unit, and they cut the strap. What a monstrous thing to do. Not only to go into a locked storage of someone, but to cut property. This is about the 10th or 12th thing that's been cut by the monsters who have been hazing and harassing my life and thinking they have rights to do so in my life. But if I talk about that, people think that I'm not 
completely there, and that's not true either. I got a computer that keeps powering down, which is not its lawful right to do, and yet it does it automatically. This is the ridiculousness of technology planning of some people. But let me get back to my story. When I was there, I had a lovely time because a parishioner outside, despite the color of vehicle he was driving in, which I knew there could be somewhat trouble based on the color and type this man was driving, based on marketing data and research I've proven in my travels in homelessness and marketing myself across the community when I had a vehicle, that there might be an issue. But he welcomed me and said, hey, if you'd like to come in and get some coffee or something, we'd love to have you. And I said, thank you, I might do that a little bit. I waited for when the Lord said it was time for me to go in, and I did that. And when I went in, I was received pretty well. I put my bags and things down in their little lounge area. I didn't have to worry about someone pilfering stuff like I had at other churches. And I walked over and I made myself some tea. The Lord said, listen, don't just use one tea bag. Use two, please. You'll like the taste and flavor better. Make sure you have a couple pieces, some sugar into your cup because you like that. And you know what? It was one of the most wonderful teas I had made for myself, and I really needed the fluids. I cannot drink water alone. That is my issue. I have a physical illness, I guess, that makes me a proponent against water alone. I have to put something in my water, taint my own water with my own control, my own personal flavors that my tongue likes and my taste buds can handle. I don't like people to choose that for me. I prefer certain flavors, and I will always use those flavors because I know how it fits with my body and my cells and how the Lord guides me to what I need and what flavor this week versus next week versus three weeks from now. When you submit your life to God, you submit everything. People often joke about trying to lose weight. I'm like, okay, did you submit that to God in prayer, or did you just submit it in a, a, a jest? If you really submitted it to God completely, then when you're at the store, you will hear the Lord say, Eat this, not that, like those famous books are. And the Lord will say, you don't need that this week. Even though you really want some, I want you to not eat it this week. You see, the Holy Spirit walks with us. It surrounds us like the force. It is like that spirit and soul that you felt when you watched Harry Potter to the point that it unnerved my niece in one of the latter films. And I Lord, it got me unnerved too. There is an evil in the world and the land is true. There are men who participate in evilly harming stalking, hazing, harassing individuals. There are people who are out of control with their gun control. There are reasons that the women of the world don't want their babies, their children, their husbands, their family members shot by people who don't have the right and should never be offered a gun. I have a fishing gun license, but I'm only interested in fishing. I have visited a gun shop just to see A, what it's like, B, what the people are like in there, and C, to see how they'd receive an old codger like me based on how I look right now. It was sort of a comical experience. The guy was sort of a miffed and not at all. He just sort of treated me like I was a bozo, and I decided to play the bozo because that's how I was treated because I wasn't really going to purchase a gun. Who the hell wants to spend $300 on something when you've got food yet to eat? But there's always someone who thinks that one thing can be turned into a weapon. The truth is anything in a house can be turned into something to defend yourself. When you're being hazed, harassed, stalked, harmed, medicated in ways you don't like, and otherwise. But the reality is, a man with a gun is allegedly more dangerous than a man with anything else, like a chain that goes on a key ring. That's not true either. Or a lanyard that they can keep their key rings in. I've seen people hit people with their lanyards, and that's not right because it hurts. Keys are like thrashing of Jesus. I can't remember what that throng was called, that flogging was called, and what that actual apparatus was, but it hurt like hell, I'm sure. Now, if I swear, people don't like it because I don't think that pastors swear. That's not true. According to one of the pastors, Tim, at a large grace church in Noblesville, that people do swear sometimes. My sister told me, recanted the story about that, how he sweared in front of her, and she was impressed by that because it made her feel like he was real and authentic. I like that, too, a little bit because the people of the land swear. Men, in particular, curse all the time. I listened to some couple of men talking about a marketing plan that literally could have been written in the hour they spent together. They didn't produce anything at all in that hour except the young man talked to the older man swearing every other word. I was appalled. I swear when I'm passionate about something. I swear when I stub my toe. I also swear in a foreign language so that I'm not rude to the people around me. And for the most part, Japanese aren't around me. But if I admit that I know the Japanese language, then some bozo wants to come and test me. I'm like, you know, I don't need to be tested. I had a family, I had a spouse, I had a child that I raised bilingually, and I don't need to be tested about anything by anyone anywhere. I don't profess to know every single word that there is, but if you were to ask a native Japanese person 
what a word meant, they usually will point to me and say, ask him, because I studied vocabulary sheets and I produced more adult language than one learns in a typical course. Now, if I talk about this, what happens? My entire life's work was deleted off of my hard drives in a home allegedly locked and safe at my sister's. Now, if in a fit of rage she deleted, fine. If her neighbor, who was not here totally lawfully, did it, then he should go to jail for that. If another neighbor thought they'd get in and monkey around on behalf of my sister, then he should go to jail. My life's work was not someone's right to mask me with, and no police officer had the lawful right to take my journals, but all my journals are gone. My journals with all the police who've been fucking around, excuse my language, in my life for the past three years are gone. Unless my sister took them. But I know she did because she manhandled my property. I had everything put in suitcases with friends to look over how I laid things so that when we got back to looking at them again, it wouldn't just be my mind looking at that stuff. And what did you know? The things that I put together were not together anymore. The clothes that I put together in one suitcase were all a mess in another. My legal documents were completely removed and never provided to me. I've got two trail cameras still allegedly in her house, in a basket on a shelf along with a handful of other little items that are no longer returned to me. You see, I got manhandled in that situation, too. I've been litigated to death by my own siblings, which I find offensive, considering I'm homeless. Now, I'm trying to produce a new life as a pastor. In order to do that, I have to put myself out there, promote myself differently, and figure out how to share with people God's energy. You see, the Force flows through us and around us, as we learn by listening to the first Star Wars way between Ben Kenobi and Luke Skywalker. I literally can show that force to people, and I love showing it to people because that magical force has protected me in my life. And listening to the Lord give me guidance has protected me from other aspects and things that I didn't want to experience. I've also been raped and harmed in other ways by men who had no lawful right to touch my personal being. I've had monsters in situations of incarceration literally shave my legs as if they had the right to do it. That was illegal, immoral, and a form of rape. I'm telling you the truth, and I don't lie about my circumstances or my situations. When I make intelligent comments about marketing with this beard, it's because I have to take all my experiences and produce into my life another opportunity. So why not learn from what I'm learning from? I've produced a lengthy set of slides on homelessness. Most people need to hear those slides. It's my own research data that I'm putting together, my own experiences of dealing with pastors and regular lay people, and openly I've had some beautiful blessings from some people who are wonderful, total strangers to me. I also have been manipulated by strangers who might have thought they were purchasing rights to things which I never gave them rights to. I've had people buy me hotel rooms out of great kindness, but then come into the hotel room in the night and take my property and monkey around with it, or allow someone in the staff to do so. You see, we have a problem in this land that we have foreigners here who bring their cultural etiquettes together. In the Japanese culture in particular, they lie. It's a part of their politeness. They don't have a lot of frank talk. They do a lot of polite lying, but most people know that it's polite. It took me a while to figure that out because I'm an American and I was raised in a household where truth is sort of black and white. Now, in truth, there are some gray areas of truth. There's truth and then there's truth. There's a true soul for someone, and then there's the truth about their physical being. There are men who are very, very short, who feel 10 foot tall because of how they were raised, to feel proud of themselves in their own minds, hearts, and souls. There are women who are overweight, who still are beautiful in their souls, making them absolutely gorgeous to any man who sees the soul. You see, there's true, and then there's truth. The woman might be truthfully overweight, but she's absolutely stunning to any man who can see her soul. You see, that's what I'm talking about with truth and true. There's going to be other monsters who are going to make that and turn it into a negative thing. They're going to say the soul of this person might be this, but this over here is their body. We don't like their body and soul not matching, so we're going to force their body to work. That is not their lawful right to do because the Lord God made that soul. The Lord God chose what sort of form to put it in based on what parents they, he chose, she chose, mother and father God chose and selected to put that soul within. Now I'm talking politics, again, where I started. We have politicians that are talking all up in the face about parenting and education. This is absolutely true. 
It took me a while to come along with my idea about it. For the longest time, I was annoyed. I thought, you know, there's more professions out there that need improved wages than just teachers. There's more professions out there that need to know more about technology and how to protect our hearts, minds, and soul from the monsters that keep trying to use audio files to monkey with us when we're in shops, making us buy more, spend more than we really can afford. There's a lot of people who have material goods, it's true, but our material goods belong to us because it's our discretionary income that purchased them. But there are people who lie to themselves in the land about thinking they have rights to steal those things. They have rights to put their hands through them. They have the rights to take intellectual property or documents off computers. They have the rights to monkey around in someone's sleeping arrangement. I literally had a girl, kind enough, to pull over and ask me if I'd like a ride. Now let me preface this with some of God's talking to me. The night before, I had literally been woken up on a bench where I found to sleep, not in the rain, underneath the very few awnings in Hamilton County that actually was protecting me from the rain of that evening. And a policewoman was standing over me when I woke up. I don't remember and recall exactly whether she touched me to wake me or whether the Lord woke me, which the Lord tends to do in those situations. But openly, she looked at my pack where I was putting my drop cloth back in, something that God had told me to purchase and explained how to utilize to keep myself warmer in the winter months and off the damp ground of the morning dew. She looked at that pack, and immediately I heard the Lord say, she's going to take that pack from you. I was nervous about that, so I quickly packed it up and moved it out of her, her ability to put her hands on it. But I also realized what it also meant, that a part of the monkeying that's been going on in my life from the sheriff and other people, that she would likely come and get it in the night when I was sleeping. That didn't exactly happen that way. The girl that I was telling you about in the blue sedan who picked me up after I went to uh, a place to get some uh, clothing uh, that is a kind place who's de Mumford. I can't remember exactly what it is, Saint something. But openly, she picked me up as I was walking towards my next destination, Fishers. I literally walk between two major cities of Hamilton County, Noblesville and Fishers. Now, if I tell you that, I'll probably get someone driving by and go, hey, I know you, I listen to you, or something like that, which would be lovely. But the reality is that every time I'm on the road is not safe, is not true, that God guides me when to go so there's less traffic, when to walk so I don't get hit by trucks and other things. And frankly, what happened was she picked me up. She really did drive me to where I needed to go, and I didn't lie about where I needed to go. I was too tired to mess with it. And my packs, I thought, came out of her car with me. The Lord did say, do you have everything? And I was really tired in that moment. So either she drove off, here we go with the lights again, somebody upstairs monkeying with my lights, not allowing me to do my recording, and I'm just going to put it out there that this library didn't have this happening at all before. I had no problem with this before, but somebody is monkeying and playing around, and I'm pretty sure I got a pretty good grasp of who that might be, but that's okay. But back to my story. That blue sedan that picked me up, the girl's name was Brittany. She had her hair up in braids, which was sort of unusual for her age demographic, and she looked a little like Pippi Longstocking with black hair, and frankly, I didn't care because she was kind enough to allow me in the front seat. She talked about how her back seat was full and a mess, which was a lie. But I just let the lie go. And I literally simply got a ride where I needed to go. When I got out of the vehicle, the Lord said, hey, do you have all your stuff? And I looked and I thought I did. But then I discovered later after I got into my storage unit that my pack was gone. And I distinctly remember putting my pack up on something in the storage unit. When I turned around to pick it up to leave, it was completely gone. Now, there's only two ways that could have happened. One... She walked in onto the property, and while I was working, she peeked around the garage to see I wasn't paying attention, and she took that back, or the management company that is often on the grounds showing people new units and other things took it, or I suppose some drive-by stranger stopped their car after they drove by and stole it, but that's really immoral and illicit, and you'd think there'd be a videotape to prove that situation. It could have been a law enforcement person walking on the property or working in the moonlighting hours for that company. I have no way of knowing. I just know that the Lord said that they would take it, and lo and behold, my pack is gone. Inside that pack was two hats, one precious hat to me that was gifted by my father to my son, and my son gave it to me because he felt it was better on my head. So it meant something to me. Two of a hat brand new that I just got for $5 to give me a different option as the spring came into being. Along with my wool blanket from my mother, the drop cloth the Lord had me buy, my monocular that the God guided in heaven guided me to purchase 
from a metaphysical store that worked wonderfully for my eyesight, my utility tool that allows me to cut things and do things and fix jewelry that I make and all sorts of stuff, along with my special cards of the Dalai Lama, a piece of literature about my passcodes, and some other mail. So in one swell swoop, not only did they commit a crime against my life in stealing that, they took intellectual property, they also took religious items, they took household items, and also in that password pack was a urinary device that allows me to do something that I need to do sometimes, which is to go to the bathroom. Now at what point did that girl realize what she did? Or at what point did the person who stole things figure out what they had? I don't know. But who gave them the right to pick it up in the first place? That's where the illness of the land needs to be fixed. When I'm talking here, I'm not bothering to look at the camera today because I don't get these man major monitors. They put the camera so high up, it's unnatural to look up like that. They really should just have a separate camera that pulls off, but the problem is someone will think they have the right to take it. Now in life, we have moments of time to really help someone to move forward. In my situation, I need a couple things. I need daily food like most people. I need a place to shave or shower on occasion to stay clean and to stay healthy. And I've got a foot problem right now in my toe because I've not been able to always keep my boots from being waterlogged because someone ruined my boots. I sprayed them down. They should have been perfectly fine, but someone could have traded out my boots for theirs. Someone stole my insoles after I bought them out of my sister's home. I put those insoles in and lo and behold, I came back to put my boots on. The insoles were taken by somebody. What kind of a monster goes into someone's house and start to do that? But they got into my stuff all the time in my sister's house. There's no way to prove she didn't do it. There's no way to prove that the, that the neighbors didn't do it. But if I talk about that to any police officer, do they care? No. If I say, you know, I've seen some shady dealings going on outside that church, or I've seen this going on at that McDonald's, or if I say anything like that, they just make fun. I'm thinking you're wasting your time monkeying around with me when you should really be capturing the people who lie to themselves about their rights in other people's lives. Whoever took my pack thought that they had the right to take my sleeping gear. So I have literally been cold in the night. I've had to be on wet, damp things. My clothes don't smell as good as they once did, but I'm still changing them, I'm still bathing, I'm still doing all the things that a man and woman, whoever, is out in the cold in homelessness because of all the lies that have been put on a person's name. And that's what happens. What do you think identity theft is? It's someone saying, I'm this person, I'm going to monkey with their mail, I'm going to redirect it, I'm going to turn off their business account, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. That is lawfully identity theft. My last point to you is that the Lord gave me information about what was going on with my pack. The Lord said she would take it. The problem was I was still waking up from being in deep REM sleep, something I don't get a lot of these days. And I couldn't remember the girl's name. I couldn't remember this woman, female police officer's name or the male officer and the other one who didn't get out of the car at all behind them. Why does a man who's asleep soundfully on a bench behind a building, not bothering any one human being in the world, need to be woken in the middle of the night by these people? What gives them the right to do that? I don't walk into their house and wake them up in their bedroom. Now that might have been my bedroom for the night, but I should have been allowed to sleep there. I've also been monkeyed around with at certain local colleges, and I don't appreciate that either. So this mobbing and this stalking that these people are doing and this hazing of my life needs to stop, but where do you go for help if you're not allowed to go to the people that are allegedly supposed to help in those situations? You just continue on. You tolerate the crap, and you move forward praying for somebody, just one person, to get what homelessness is, to get how close they are because they have no retirement in the bank, and openly... That's my right to talk about. I always joke I'm not a financial planner because most financial planners are expecting to come to them with ten grand. Great, if you've got that, then you're on your way. But if you are living paycheck to paycheck, like according to Career Builder Survey, that 78% of Americans are, we're all looking at working retail jobs into our late 70s and 80s of, of age. Why? To provide for us food. Unless we have a child that's going to open their home and let us live with them, or unless we have created a incredibly successful child who will put us in an independent living facility or assistant living facility that costs anywhere from $2,000 to $3,000 per month for us to live there and participate with other residents once our spouse has passed on. You see, people downsize in their 60s. 
I sort of did that in my late 40s. I have property that I have the right to sell, but we have no solicitation signs in the communities that make it difficult for people to go on in life. I'd like to sell my book to some churches, but when I call, they say, we have to look it over to decide whether or not our pastor believes with what it says, and then we'll think about buying it. Whereas I've been in some churches where the pastor says, you know what, I know you're only trying to sell me one book, but I'd like two copies. I'd like one for myself and one for our library that we're launching. And I just am sitting there humbled going, well, it's an imperfect work, but I'm thankful for the sale because I need to eat. Thank you for modeling Jesus in that moment of time. I have a handful of copies left of whatever I have left. The monsters who deleted my hard drives deleted my books that I worked on. My entire Japanese language programs, all of my authored works that I wrote, almost 14 books. You see, when a monster does this, that monster gets away with it because the people who know what they did don't tell the police the right information. Now, in time, we have moments to help a person go forward. There are certain tools that I technically need, and my computer went, that was a gift from my mother and father while he was still alive, went to black screen because somebody monkeyed with it, broke the corners, broke things off near the power plug, and openly, nobody gives a shit. It's not true. I also need transportation, and I need some way to get out of the rain. I've simply said to a couple of churches, you've got 12,000 people in your mega church. Are you telling me that not one person has a backyard and a lawn chair that I could sleep on to remain safe from the elements and to remain safe on private property where I can't be monkeyed with and I might get a full night's rest? How literally hard is it for an affluent community to produce this? I cannot fathom. So I've decided to become a pastor because while I may not be able to memorize the words of God and exactly where they are in the Bible, I can certainly teach people how to produce for them the magic of the Lord. How incredible that is. And I owe all of that understanding, all of the safety I've received, all of my ability to get just about anywhere without GPS and not be lost because the Lord is with me, to one amazing, incredible female who took the time after going to a Christian girly conference to show me a tool she bought. And that tool worked for me in seconds and told me something in that moment that made my heart sing. And my little soul continues to love that woman and I will love her all the days of my life. And if I had any opportunity at all to mate with another person, she would be the one I would choose for my life. And practically, I'd love it if people would pray for me today. That not only that I get a pastoring role someplace or a set of seeking, speaking series so that I might produce for myself some income to buy food, but also that I might provide myself a place to stay that is safe from the monsters who harm my life medical practitioners who lie about their rights in my life, and the people of birth family who have violated my rights many times over. Now what my name is today doesn't matter because what it might be tomorrow might be something different, simply to allow myself the peace of mind to go on in the land. Thanks for listening.